phone, which is also my watch over there. So oh, you can you keep a, keep track for me? Um, I, there's you know time to go through that that whole bit. One thing I'm noticing, just sort of a general technical sort of thing, as the bow extends out, I'd say about at this point, there's a little bit of drawing out at this angle. So you're losing a certain kind of clarity of contact sometimes, and it's just it's just a habit you want to uh, nip in the bud. You know, if you just think particularly uh, after about this range of the bow of um, It's a feel, it's hard to describe a feel, but it's basically a feeling of out. And it allows you to really kind of dig that contact in, so that, um, you know, occasionally, once you get out there, you know how you'll get like a little bit of bouncing sometimes, just kind of losing the contact. So you don't, you don't really have leverage once you get back up to this angle. Um, a really extreme example, if you ever like go onto YouTube and watch uh, uh, videos of Pincus Zuckerman playing, that he's very much kind of out and in and out and in and out and in. And his, his playing is such a, a model of maintaining this incredibly intense contact throughout the, the stroke. Um, anyway, into some more specific things. Um, there's a certain, you know, this molto appassionato of the opening, there's a certain breathlessness, I think, that's implied in these upbeats to everything, you know. Dum, da 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 di, da 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 and uh, the bowing that you did, which many 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 people do, of putting that e onto the same down bow, um, it's a bowing of convenience, um, but you don't want to lose the effect of. You know, I always think of phrasing as being very conversational, right? And so this is one of those examples of. You know, if you're, you're telling a story and it's, it's a story that you're quite excited about, you, there are tendencies where we will interrupt ourselves as we're telling the story. I mean, this thing happened and then, I mean, and then it was like, and this, you know, you get all kind of tied up over yourself. And I'm, you know, each one of those interjections adds a little bit of impulse into the figure, which I think it keeps it from sitting too much. You know, so it's not necessarily an issue of, you know, you don't have to play it faster, but if there's this feeling of turbulence underneath, I think that will help. Um, why don't you just play a little bit from the beginning and I'll, I'll stop you. If, you. if we get as far as A right now, which we likely won't. Sorry. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Just like that. Um, if we get as far as A, the The accents there, I think, are quite important to be quite sharp with it. Otherwise, what happens is we hear the accents on the bow changes, so then we get misplaced. You know? And then we get to there, and it's like, wait, where are we? You know what I mean? There's a certain sort of squareness to this part. All right, I wanted to take from the beginning. you to do it, but uh, one example being right there at the end, it, um, it got a little, and then that kind of weakened the, the beginning of that note. Um, can you just play on your own, and in terms of the shape of it, if you think of a taper of, so that each one of these fourth beats is restarting it. You know what I mean? We, it gets a little bit to this, if we have. We're, 
would be a very exaggerated take. So basically, phrase away from the G and away from the B. Can you just do that on your own? Yeah, and, and I don't mean to mess with your Boeings. You know, you can kind of do whatever Boeing you like. And now, uh, one more step would be to... If you do something with the vibrato to add, add interest to the half notes. You know, I just said I won't mess with your bone. I'm gonna mess with your bone. Because I think that, I think that it will give a better clarity to that note. And I think that what's important now is that we develop the, the shape and the concept. And then if you decide to go back to the old hooked bowing, that's fine. But I would definitely, even if you do take it all on a down, I wouldn't slur through it. I would re-articulate. Um, that was great. Can you just go on from... And think of maybe this, bring this hairpin up to say a mezzo forte, and this one maybe up to just a mezzo piano. Can you just take a break from there? Okay, so there's a little effect there. I'm gonna exaggerate. This is not quite what you did, but the note didn't really start. The hairpin crests on that note, you know, and that's that's one of the great challenges of playing any bowed instrument is actually, we're, all, well, we're also afraid of actually starting the notes. <laughs> you know, you hear so much of, kind of and people, um, I've had people, you know, they're like, well, you know, it's kind of the nature, it's like, no, it's not, it's not, it's laziness, don't do it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> could you take one more time and really think of, really visualize that shape of cresting over that bar line? Yes. Go on. Yeah, I like the I like the, the the effort. I think what's happening now is it's sort of it, you know I can tell that you're you're putting something there, but it's not quite precise what's happening. And I think that I would slow it down in your practice to just really coordinate the landing, so to speak. You know, um, and that and that'll take some time. You know, that's not something I expect you to do right away. Can I can I see your bow for just a quick second? sort of snap the wrist. For me, the, the best way to feel tension on a bow and where you want it to be is if you kind of snap it in the middle range, and if the bow starts to skip, it's usually because it's not quite tight enough. Um, try that and see, see how it feels. This bit here, um, it's the second bar of it was very, very good and well coordinated. The, uh, the first bar in a bit of those broken octaves, the challenge for every violinist in that is coordinating it so that your hands move at the same time, so to speak. So basically what happens is it, the, the, the string crossing is where they get lazy and you start to move at the wrong time. So I would, can you just play for me? Just like that with the breaks of the string crossings. Yeah, so practice like that until you feel very confident about that change point. Um, 
that change point. And then one thing that you're doing really quite well already is um, I'm getting more clarity than I usually hear on those last notes of the triplet. So that's something that obviously you're paying attention to is not shifting the hand before the third note of the triplet is speaking, but it, as well as you're doing it could still be better still. You don't want to get, you know, the, the sort of smear effect at the end of those. So think of, um, I think that a lot about this in my own practicing of, of creating landmarks um, that are, uh, you ever mess around with like a uh, garage band or any sort of, you know, music programming things and you know when you basically you splice those tracks in very specific places and at speed it's seamless but you can see it visually as a clear defining split. And I'm always putting things like that in my mind, you know, so that if I play the passage and it's da -da 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 that's what I want people to hear, but how I need to feel it is that each one of them is very cleanly delineated. Um, let's go on a little bit. Um, could you give a couple of bars into, into the next uh -huh. entrance? And I'd like to hear, the, the kind of shapes that you were building through here, I'd like to hear them a little bit more exaggerated so that the highs are a little higher. I think that um, just right, right now there was, there was a lot of beautiful stuff that was happening, but it was all kind of, I was getting foothills instead of mountains. <laughs> So it's as you're moving down, be as careful with those as when you're moving up the fingerboard. Um, these things we were getting a little bit of separation there. It was kind of along the lines of what I was talking about on the previous page, where the note it wasn't really it wasn't starting in a natural way. Can you play that for me one time? Think of that up into down connection. No. You don't wanna you don't wanna have that. Can you stick on your arms from there? Did you hear that how the you you were kind of you had been in the string, I would put it this way, you'd been in the string through there, and around here you started being on the string rather than in the string. <laughs> it had lost a certain contact. We'll take one more time from here. better. Um, that I was kind of hearing, I was hearing a bit, I was hearing quite a bit of juice <laughs> in there and then on the way up as well. Um, see. I might suggest actually, I think that's a bit of an old-fashioned style of playing that. Um, if you went down into first position on that first F, 
then you end up going, you can use the shift up into position here as a way of preparing the color change, and it keeps you from having a downward slide followed by an upward slide almost immediately. So you know, this is such clean passage work, you have this cleanness and then you have the kind of slurpiness at the bottom of it. I don't know if I love that. Um, two with, minutes. Two minutes, okay. I talk really fast like an auctioneer. Um, this here. <laughs> voice the top uh, as much as you can. Think about, basically in a, in a technical sense, think about as much motion as possible to get over to that string, or else you end up and you don't really hear this top. So just really think of just kind of getting over. Um, this bit here at E, when you're putting it together with the piano, think of it, the two of you are like, it's like a pendulum sort of effect. The piano has these Forte pianos or sportsandi or something on the downbeats, right? Forte pianos, yeah. So they have ba, and then you have. You, so you're not actually. You're never working in combination, but rather you're doing it in different times in different ways. So I would go. exaggerated effect, but when you have that with the piano or with an orchestra, it's really quite a great effect of this almost like a seesaw, the heaviness of the orchestra countered by the heaviness of the violin, so that it doesn't become vertical. Of, you, you hear it so often. Of, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's what we don't want. <laughs> um, it's just beautiful. I thought in this, uh, this Tranquilo bit, that at times, at times it didn't have quite, it was very tranquil, but then it, I think there needs to be a little bit more drama that's brought into it or else it's, it starts maybe being a little bit too tranquil for too long. <laughs> um, here, this transition of Think of this G is, this is one of those dovetail moments where it closes the last phrase but also launches the next phrase. So I think you want to think of that as more of an elision rather than a, than a splice, you know? Um, a really nice effect is to remember that this instance of the triplets is only piano, and this one is pianissimo, um, which we always forget that that's twice as soft, <laughs> you know? So you can be a little bit more full-bodied with this one if you'd like, and you know, bringing out those uh, accents. And this one, don't be afraid to let the bow really jump off the string a little bit, um, just for the sake of contrast. And we're done. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, Our next student is Nate Tavakolian.
Sometimes what I'm noticing for you is not necessarily that it's causing any lack of contact, but that sometimes it puts you in a position where, you know, if, you, if you're playing at, at this angle, the bow is going to start to skip. So it's sometimes on the up bows that I feel I'm not quite getting the quality of contact that you have. Um, I'm going to make a suggestion for the, the very opening, just in terms of the fingering that I like. You know, for me, it's all about simplifying. <laughs> and right now, you're basically making one shift, two shifts. I prefer to do one. Try for me, just one, one, four. And then just going, so you have one shift from a four to a one. Yeah, I mean, finding that note will take a little getting used to, yeah. but then you've only got one note to find yeah. <laughs> instead of two. Um, this, uh, hold the audience interest through that C sharp 
right through into the A. And then similarly hold the, the tension of the line through the A into the piano uh, modulation there. Um, why don't I just hear this, this little opening flourish one more time, maybe from the opening. a lot. I've got like five things, I just say them over and over and over. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> this, in terms of uh, blocking in your mind that, so that those first four notes are really clean, if you get those first four notes clean, a lot of things fall into place after that. It's one of those things that, you, you know, it's sort of like, to use a football term, this whole passage here is kind of like icing the kicker. You know, it's like, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go, but you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to wait, and then all of a sudden, you have to do it. And I think that often we get ahead of ourselves right over that first shift from the E flat to the G. Mm -hmm. Can you just play that once for me, and just thinking of ultimate clarity on the first four. Do you hear that bit? You're, you're moving, mm -hmm. I'm hearing that shift before the fourth note has actually sounded. Just play once for me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So just practice like that, sort of keeping a, a clean line of demarcation in your head, and eventually the, the hole that you've created gets smaller and smaller to the point where no one else is hearing it. Um, Actually, why don't we take with the piano, can you give just, even just the bar before the violin? Okay. Mm -hmm.
this figure. This section. Um, there needs to be a little bit more of a story of what you're saying there. Uh, um, really, through this whole bit, we, we kind of get this uh, 3 plus 2, 3 plus 2, 3 plus 2, over and over and over. And I think that each one of them has to have something slightly different to say, you know. so that it doesn't become... Like, I think that this, this piece can either be... I feel like there's very little in between with this piece. It's either just, like, the greatest piece ever or it's just kind of annoying. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I think it's because, really, the material, the material itself, it's really... You, it, it needs to... You need to make something of it. Um, and... And what you're doing, I don't mean to say you're not, but I think that you need to exaggerate your impulses. Can you take just the pickup into that? And make a story, make us think each time we hear that pattern, well, what's the next one going to be? And we'll, in, You know what I mean? So that you're not setting up something that's going to be repetitive. You're instead using it as a way to create an interest for what's going to come next. Mm -hmm. There's the danger of it uh, coming across a bit like a bit like a gymnastics routine. Like, you know how you watch the Olympic gymnasts? And I'm thinking particularly of like things like uh, like the female floor floor routines or the balance beam, where it's like they do all their like stuff and they're like. And it's like, come on, get on with it already. And then you can always tell when the big technical elements come because they're like. <laughs> and then they do these like incredible backflips and stuff. And you never want music to seem that way, but this piece can seem that way. You know, it's. And all everyone wants is. All that kind of business. So it needs to be more organic. Um, uh, can you go from, from the letter E? And this was excellent, excellent playing. I just want to go over a couple, a couple of little things. Actually, why don't you, with the piano, two before E. Two minutes. Perfect. 
Um, I meant to mention this earlier. Where was it? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, a lot of these things, you have these augmented seconds. Um, um, those need to always be slightly exaggerated. You know, in a case like that, make sure the three is really high and the two is really low. Otherwise, you, it, if they're not almost stretched past the point, um, then it just sounds a little bit like some sort of weird Middle Eastern scale, you know, where it's like, where are those notes? Um, There's a lot of places in here where you're going to want to think about those demarcations. There's, a, there's one for me. I always think about that shift. It's very important. Um, basically, divide up in your, in your mind where the shifts are happening and practice them putting in breaks. Because it's, it's so much easier to sew it together once the mind has carefully organized where everything takes place. Um, uh, the Another thing with those, that kind of diminished thing there, make sure that those intervals are really careful. Um, here, I would be quite spiky and off the string with that stuff because it's just texturally such a nice, uh, Break up of the variety of so much of the of the slurs. Um, again, the, the, you know, careful with all these intervals just to make sure they're really, really locked in. Um, I think here, what I would recommend is once you land on the high notes, there can be a, a, enough of a decay of tension, if not volume, that then you can make a shape, a broad shape, all the way down. Dun, dun, bum. So this whole thing can be, frankly, I think there's too many bows. I think that this is one of those things that's a little more effective if you bow it one to a bar, because I really want it to feel like, you know, there's a certain sort of beating, so. So all of a sudden the pulse slows way down and it creates a really nice kind of swimming effect. Um, Time's up. Time's up. Well, this is all the same anyway. I mean, that's kind of the nice thing about this movement, right? It's like once you play the first half, you kind of have the second. <laughs> all right, well, bravo. Thanks for Thank you.
beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, yeah, this is going to be going to be fun because there's like just there's not much there's nothing wrong with what you do. So we could just sort of talk about fun stuff. Um, as a general thing, um, I feel a little bit forgive me, but I, I feel that and we all struggle with this that there are things, there are technical things happening that are causing musical effects. You know, like, like the, the action of playing the violin is affecting the musical decisions being made rather than the other way around. Um, and basically what I'm, but I say that because I think it will be a very easy thing for you to fix. A lot of what I'm hearing is we, uh, there's quite a bit of localized stuff happening because things tend to blossom for you in the middle of the bow. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, I started thinking as the movement was going along that the, the piece for me, the pulse is actually very broad. Um, a lot of things I'm sort of hearing bar by bar as a factor, the bow changes, whereas I think you want to hear things over bigger units. Um, um. start to hear each one of those as being the same, it just, it makes things somehow take longer, <laughs> you know? Um, and there are certain things in this, this movement, and Fourier's music in general, that they're kind of ambiguous as to where the shapes go, and I need to get a clearer sense from you of what it is you're doing, you know? Is it a, or is it, It's not like there's a right or wrong, but I need to know which, which is okay. your intention. Um, so yeah, basically, I mean, in a nutshell, that's one of the two things that, that I'd suggest thinking about a little more in this one. The other is, is that I feel that you can play, uh, play around with finding a broader spectrum of colors. Um, you make a very beautiful sound, uh, but it tends, for my taste, to be a little bit the same beautiful sound. Um, I think that you can explore in a piece like this in particular, um, and we'll get to some sort of specific stuff, but moving the, the sounding point a little further out and um, accelerating the bow, particularly through uh, bow changes, which will also, uh, that will in turn help uh, lengthen the lines. Um, could you maybe just give us a couple of bars into the violin opening and think of um, what we were talking about there with almost like run-on sentences, okay. you know? Don't, don't put in very many periods. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. 
production of piano wire, of all things. And as it comes out of this machine, it has to be very carefully, they probably have more high-tech ways of doing it, but it has to be very carefully pulled to make sure that if it's jerked at all, it nicks the string and the string becomes useless. And I think of that with these long phrases, you have to be very controlled to make sure that you don't lose, somehow lose the focus, because then it kind of, the whole thing crumbles at that point. Um, five minutes. Five minutes, great. Can you just, um, actually right on figure B is perfect. <laughs> Um, 
which I think is mainly going to be starting a little softer, actually, rather than getting louder. Excuse me for blocking the video. Focus now a little bit more on removing those little sort of donuts. Um, they're, they're slight, but they're still happening a little bit. And it's putting in the second half of the team. The, the leading notes over the bar line to make sure that there's enough of that, that thread pulling through. So that it's not like, oh boy, I've got to play a scale in octaves. It's like, no, you have a few whole steps, and then you've just got half steps, and the half steps are not a big deal. Okay. You know, once again, it's all about making it easier than it seems. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we're probably one more minute. <laughs> Smart to say in one minute. Um, it's basically the same, the same type of, uh, of stuff that all applies. Through here, you know, there can be more sort of drama. And here, you really want to think of these as two bar things. And then four bars. So that it, this part, to me, can sag, because it can sound like da 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 And it so really, really draw the listener to two plus two plus four. Uh, you know, then you end up with three things instead of eight. Yeah. All right, how's that for smart? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Thank you.
Oh, thank you. It's a little messy. No, it's quite all right.
ideas of uh, the, the the piece is so beautiful, but you know it can seem a little um, a little spare at times, you know. And I think that uh, I think about ways to create a little bit more sort of drama. Um, I think one one thing for me that would kind of immediately help is if you just nicked the tempo up one notch okay. or something. Um, the fact that it's in 2-4, you know, the, you'd never want it to sort of feel da, 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 you know, the da, ba, da, 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 that there's just a little bit more buoyancy in larger beats. I think that, that will help. Um, and particularly when it gets into the more lyrical stuff, the, that it allows them to speak a little more freely and not get quite as stuck in the eighth notes. Um, can you just take from the beginning, just you know, really very slight, but the the thought of, of that shift into a true two being important. Yeah, right there. Is fine. You know, there was there was a taper to it and the shape, but it felt a little bit, a little bit like uh, you were addressing an audience, and then you kind of mm -hmm. away for that. And I think it needs to have that same shape, but a shape for the back of the room. Oh, one more time. <laughs> Like you're kind of closing the phrase, but then you're right back there. Um, here is one of those one of those spots where it just musically yeah. there's not a lot happening, yeah. right? Um, maybe you build through the whole thing. Maybe you do a bigger and then an echo and then something else. There needs to be some kind of added drama yeah. to it. I mean, one of my favorite things about Haydn, um, do you ever play any, any Haydn quartets? Not a lot, the bird, like a long time uh, ago. So yeah. I, think, I think there's 67 quartets, 68 quartets, something like that. And I've realized over years of playing them that Haydn gives you frustratingly little information. Where it, there's just, you play it through and the first instinct for me is always, yeah, it's, it's nice. And then you play it through again, and it's like, yeah, that's really nice. And then you play it through again, and you're like, well, that's the best piece I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, but there's so little information which can be frustrating, but can also be such an opportunity for creativity. You know, it's never micromanaged, and it becomes the challenge to the player of how how creative can you be? How compelling can you be with the with the story? Um, let's go on. You know, here you can be so lyrical and, and so um, almost lush, and then you know it's it's funny how I just got through with saying that Haydn gives so little information, but he can sometimes be. He can use a remarkable amount of ink for something that he thinks is important. And think of that. Mm -hmm. Tick, 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 tick. Like, he left this, to, there is no ambiguity to what he wants there. And I think that's important, you know, that you have the lyricism of these bars followed by the virtuosity of this kind of uh, 
outburst in the next bar. Um, you know, actually, just take right, right on, on the entrance at bar 57 and 5. I mean, it even, you know, I, I was right here and I was like, oh, that's cool, you know, like, that, that, that's great. Um, but I think that this here, the way you, I couldn't tell what you were saying. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, got, you got caught in between on that one a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think that, uh, well, yeah, you know, that, that needs to be a little bit clearer in the intention. <laughs> take from thinking of what you're going to say with that. You know, are you going to sort of leave us up in the air? Uh, uh, right, uh, 66. Here's the bum, 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 bum that's happening in the piano. So even if you take that on up bow, can you think of the, the you take it right there. that I wasn't quite convinced of. It was as if, you know, it, it, it was creative, which I liked, but it was sort of like something started on this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Da, 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 da. But I think that this is so, it's so attached to the G. Okay. That the, I think that this is, this kind of connective tissue that doesn't necessarily start anything new. Yeah. Um, anyway, something to think about with that. This here, um, 
There's different ways of looking at that, but in essence what you're doing is you're turning that into four and then playing this as three, yeah. which it's one of those things like, again, he's so nonspecific so often that when he's kind of specific like this, I'm not <coughs> sure that's the solution he's looking for. It would have been so easy. On the other hand, it's possible that he's just looking at, at that as a sort of an equalized appoggiatura, but then in which case, doesn't make a lot of sense to do that one so markedly different. You could take that as a true grace note if you want to. If you take it out that way, at least we're still getting the consistency and the symmetry of two triplets. Um, let's see. You know, why, why don't you just take from there and the drama? That's good. <laughs> two bars, mm -hmm. which I think are kind of, kind of fun. You know, it's like um, we get used to certain symmetries in classical formed music, and I think that uh, the fact that he's kind of breaking out of that model, you need to do something like even more compelling. Yeah. It, it, this, this, the whole issue of, of speech patterns in music, I mean, you say something and then you say it more emphatically, and you say it more emphatically yet, or whatever it is, like there's gotta be a, a pretty compelling reason to say something three times. <laughs> um, this next bit is kind of the same. Uh, well, actually, no, you know, um, could, you, uh, could you take that little tootie in the middle of bar 135? creativity in there because yeah as you say it's sort of like <laughs> is there enough going on here to sustain um, could you take that one more time and you, you know like thinking of no no wrong answers here you know I mean with the recognition that like 90% of practicing is trying things that don't work <laughs>
talk about this part a little bit. It's a really nice variety. I like the effect. I feel like there can be slightly more enunciation to the short notes. Um, you know what I mean? Like there, there are some that are speaking more clearly and there are others that you know, are a little bit fuzzier, sometimes it's having, I think it's having to do with bow uh, crossings, yeah. Yeah. Uh, string crossings. Um, can you just play that on your own and thinking of being very articulate on all of the separate notes? Two minutes. definitely going in the right direction. I think if you can exaggerate the dynamic contrast by being bigger in the, the yeah. non-spiccato ones, and uh, and then, yeah, I mean, you, you know what you're looking for with yeah. it. I, I think that it tends to be, when it happens, it's the uppos and often right after a string crossing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, why don't you play that one more time with the piano and uh, just thinking of a bigger dynamic contrast. One, five, three. to shape the bar like that, but I still want to be like, oh, when you, when you make the articulation change. Like, an effect of two different players. And what you can think of is um, almost the perspective of, uh, of whether it's antiphonal or whether it's depth, very separate instruments. Like something that I often try to do, I don't know that it actually comes across this way, but it, it helps to, to think of it is in passages like this, I think of being closer and further away, rather than being louder and softer. Because louder and softer, when you think of it that way, it exists within the same world. But if you actually think of perspective, of depth, mm -hmm. that can sometimes help separate the, um, the intention. Yeah. Well, I want to take that one bar lead in one again. <laughs> That's, um, yeah, that's a good word for, I think, what takes you through. And momentum does not necessarily imply speed at all, but that there's a reason to not get sort of settled bar by bar, or worse, of course, beat by beat. But um, anyway, I think we're out of time, but uh, beautiful playing, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
And I want you to all think about that. Well, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to play an excerpt from the Scotch Fantasy by Max Brook. Uh, there's an excerpt that I use quite often for trying out violins because it covers the entire range of the instrument, uh, all four strings and all four strings up and down uh, the register. So it's a handy way to get a sense of what an instrument does. Now, the two strats that we have here today as David mentioned, they're from the same year, so in a certain sense, they're kind of uh, they're kind of twins. So they sound fairly similar, but I wouldn't say they sound exactly the same. Stradivari, at, throughout his career, worked off different molds, and these two violins, despite being made in the same year, are made on slightly different patterns. So they have slightly different tonal ideals. And uh, I'll just leave it at that, because it's really not up to me to describe the ways in which these instruments are different. It's up to all of you to decide the ways that you feel that they're different. And you, I'm sure, all form your preferences. And I hope that you'll have uh, interesting discussions and heated arguments afterwards about which uh, <laughs> is your favorite. Uh, before I start that, I'll also mention that, as you can see, we've got a bunch of different bows up here. And we're going to have a little bit of fun with that a little bit later. But for now, I'll just uh, point out that I have chosen a different bow for each of the three different violins because I feel that each one of them has a special match with that particular bow. But I will say that all three bows were made by Francois Xavier Tours, who is often thought of as the Stradivari of the bow. So not exactly slumming it up here. <laughs> I, was, I will start with the Peter Guarneri. Uh, Dave, I think you're talking more about instruments later, but uh, Peter Guarneri is one of uh, the members of one of the most uh, heralded families in violin making history. Thank you. 
hands up, how many people noticed real differences between assessments? Okay, now how many people thought they basically kind of all just sounded like violins? Oh, that's good. That's a good, wow, there you go. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, now, as I mentioned before, we get, and as you see, we have these different bows up here. So, I've been around violins and bows my whole life. Now, I have a certain understanding of why instruments make such a difference one to the other. There's a lot going on with this. But something that is truly mysterious to me is the difference that a bow can make, particularly when you consider that the only part of the bow to actually make contact with the strings is the hair, which is replaced all the time. So why is it that bows are different? And do bows really make a difference? So as an example, this is my, my sort of number four bow that I keep in my case. It's truly a four emergencies only bow at this point <laughs> in my life. This is not to say that this is not a nice bow. I mean, it, I, I love this bow. And, uh, but I'm just saying that this wouldn't, this is, yeah, I mean, it'd buy you a car, but not a really nice car. So uh, <laughs> it's that level of bow. Uh, so listen.
Joseph Guadagnini Figueroa from 1793. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm interested. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Which is always interesting. Uh, 1793. Uh, and this is paired with probably the finest viola bow in the world. This is uh, also made by Francois Xavier Tourt. Uh, so, Bach unfortunately did not write any music for solo viola, but he wrote music for violin, he wrote music for cello. So, I'm going to play a violin movement on viola. This is the Alamán from the second partita.
Sonata number three. 